A very, very special shout out tonight to all those of you who are serving or have served in the armed forces of your country. I have the utmost respect for you. Not something I would ever want to do or would ever force my children to do. But my father was in the armed services and he served his time and was very proud of it. So, that brings me on to tonight's story. Set around the Navy in the Pacific. Strange goings on indeed, and this story goes to places that you cannot even imagine, I can tell you. Well, my dear friends, it's another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault. So, it's time once again for you all to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Private Logs, Specialist Mag B. Guffin, 2019-09-29. This is me, out at sea. You know, probably the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life was shoot up in a school parking lot. That's how I ended up here, on a boat bigger than my hometown, on my knees deep-throating Uncle Sam's brand of freedom eight days a week. I was 26, so not a student. And really, it only makes sense that the cops would get called for a strange car in a high school parking lot. Well, given America's proclivity for school massacres. But, since I was young and with no previous record, the judge cut me a break. Told me I could go ahead and enlist in Donald Trump's army. If I was willing to murder strangers for this rich, second-rate celebrity, then I could remain a free man. Well... Free outside of that binding contract the military makes you sign. Anyway, I know you probably don't give a shit about my life. For most Americans, that whole even now bullshit mentality of support our troops amounts to nothing more than don't question what our wealthy parasite overlords deign to do with our soldiers. But I feel it's necessary to give some context before we get to the weird shit I'm about to tell you. I'm an ex-junkie on Uncle Sam's imperialist brand of the scared straight program. I'm not the square-jawed Captain America kind of guy. No. Nor am I the psycho sadist type. Fourth most prominent type of soldier the military so often finds capering about within his ranks. And really, the top five types of military enlistees go in order like this. One. Poor people who feel they have no other options in life and have convinced themselves that they might just make the world a better place. (laughs) 2. Captain America types. 3. Losers, like myself, with drug problems and pending legal charges. 4. Psychotic sadists who genuinely want to rape and pillage. and 5. Colossally stupid Christians the white Jesus type, who actually think they're fighting some kind of holy war. This, in my experience, is what the proud US world police really consists of. Your tax dollars hard at work. (laughs) Just think about that every time you look over your measly paycheck from your minimum wage job. Save that thought as you see that between federal and state, you got hosed for two or three hundred bucks. God damn America. Anyway, I digress. I don't feel some higher calling to be the best of the best, and I definitely don't believe in the freedom of information more than the non-disclosure agreement I was forced to sign when I joined up in this chicken shit outfit. I'm just a normal guy with normal problems, and somehow that resulted in me finding myself in a distinctly abnormal situation, and that's what I'm here to talk about. So, uh, now that you're up to speed on me, let me bring you to today's events. I'm in my quarters right now. Pretty sure the only reason why the higher-ups haven't taken all of our laptops and phones away yet is because, well, they just straight up forgot. Due to the absolute insanity that has unfolded here in the last 24 hours. But it's only a matter of time before they do. So I'm going to write this as fast as I can. Gonna send it to my homie on the mainland, and, well, he's gonna post it. I told him not to edit anything. 
as I'll be deleting the files on my end after I send it to him. So, his copies will be the only version of the originals. I apologize for any grammatical errors, but, well, ain't nobody got time for that shit right now. I mean, Jesus' ballsack. The shit I just saw. Okay. Okay, let me take a couple deep breaths and slow this down. We were all the way out in the Pacific, and I mean way out, playing war games with the Russians. There were just two of us, all the way out there in the middle of nowhere, with literally nothing breaking the surface of the water for 400 miles in any direction. I don't know how alone you've ever been. Maybe you've hiked the Appalachian Trail or something. You know, been some place where you're truly away from society. It's just creepy. Even with a general cacophony of over 300 people sharing a limited space and the steady hum of gigantic engines, there's just something unsettling about being somewhere humans would never naturally exist. I was stationed on the USS Barry. It's an RLA Burke class destroyer. And the Ruskies were sporting a caching class destroyer. Well, I don't know how to say the real name. Let's call it Putin and Trump suck D. PTSD for short. Anyway, we're in the second day of our super manly dick waving contest. The sun was beating down upon us mercilessly from the cloudless sky. All the boys were out on deck, greased up and ready to share some <laughs> freedom. I was at my fire station, locked and loaded with my true love, my M2 Browning. Her name was Betsy. She was the most successful relationship I had had in nearly a decade. All told, there were eight fire stations arranged around the bow. The Ruskies were doing the same. It was a truly retarded gesture. Who the hell's getting into small arms ship-to-ship -ship combat in 2019? Well, when two captains feel the urge to compare their wangs, well, this is what you get. I was lollygagging at my station, drawing it with my mate Cole. His fire station was above and behind me on the second deck, close to one of our landing pads. We were just talking the usual bullshit when the call came up on our comms. A Swedish super tanker had put out a distress call. The details were scarce and made little sense. Captain Diomedes is a man of few words, though... To his credit, he's not a practitioner of the all-too-popular ego trip known as the need-to-know mentality. He relayed to all hands exactly what he himself had been told. The ultra-large, crude oil tanker, the Nanny, had run into some trouble out on the water, reporting that they'd collided with a whale. Well, that part made no sense. Super tankers are freaking beasts. They're over 12,000 feet long. What the hell was a whale going to do to that? Even if it swam directly into a propeller, kamikaze style, it would only be like a speed bump to the nanny. This, of course, changed the nature of our war game. Now the wang-waving contest had shifted from who can kill who better to who can rescue people better. Both ships immediately broke away and headed north, speeding balls out towards the emergency. Heading even farther away from land than we already were. The PTSD immediately took the lead in the race. The rumors of the Ruskies' propulsion methods proving true. The vibrations of the roaring engine six decks below were proof enough that our captain had ordered the engine room to give it their all. Though I bet Cole and Diomedes would never admit it. But, when in doubt, take to the air. That's not some wise proverb. I just made that up. Realizing that we wouldn't beat the Russian captain in a straight-up race, Diomedes ordered one of our seabirds into the air. The chopper went streaking off, leaving both ships in the dust. It wasn't until then that I noticed the heavy fog dominating the northern horizon. And I mean, dominating. We were still about a mile away. And even at this distance, the wall of murk seemed to have no end, stretching on as far as the eye could see, both east and west. And its height reached all the way up to an overcast cloud line. 
So, for all intents and purposes, after about a mile north, Kavu was zero. Well, that's some spooky shit right there. A voice to my right made me jump. Jeez, man, I sighed. Lieutenant Michael Riggs had materialized next to me. The dude was like that. A sea ninja. He could insert himself into a crowd of gossiping junior officers without anyone realizing it until some shit talking had already well and truly been underway. Howdy, McMuffin. He smirked at me. Fortunately, the guy wasn't a dick. Seeming to derive sufficient pleasure from his natural stealth in the form of startling the shit out of people. Oh, and, by the way, McMuffin was my nickname on this floating city. His gaze wandered off to the north. Just thought I'd come topside and see how everything was going, he said. Everything's shipshape up here, Lieutenant, I said quickly. He nodded absently, his eyes scanning the limited horizon. And there's no tanker in sight. So, I guess we're going into that shit, he finally said. Before I could reply, our conversation was interrupted by First Class Petty Officer John Witherspoon. Oi, lads, look here, he shouted. We called him Spoon, or Spoony, most of the time. Spoon was an army brat who spent most of his life on an American base in Britain, so he had that distinct English accent. I thought it made him sound like the most sailory sailor on the boat. He was currently occupying the frontmost gun station about ten yards ahead of me. There, off the port. Everyone on port side took a look overboard. Ah, oh, shit, man, I heard Cole say from above. I kept scanning the water. What? I shouted up to him. I don't see shit. I turned to look up at him. Cole pointed down toward the dark water. His nose wrinkled in disgust. I turned to look again. And then I saw it. It was a humpback, I think. The massive creature looked like it had been filleted by a giant, then spread open and slapped down on the surface of the water. I was grateful for the small mercy that the thing wasn't floating belly up, to at least spare us what was undoubtedly a far more gruesome sight. The smell hit as we drew nearer. It's pretty hard to describe. If you want a good idea of what it was like, head out on a hot summer day and go to the alley behind the nearest restaurant, then find the compost bin. Stick your face in and breathe in real deep. Just then, both ships began to slow. Oh, come on, Cole shouted. Do we have to slow down next to this freaking thing? It don't matter, bruv, Spoonie said grimly. Take a look at what's flowing between us and that broom. And so we did. Fuck me if the water in front of us wasn't filled with dead sea life. Dead and rotting. And smelling like the goddamned apocalypse. Not just whales. There were sharks and octopus. There were plants, small fish and jellyfish. All dead. All rotten. Oh, this has got to be some kind of oil company fuck up. Rick said, more to himself than to me. We all stared down at the water as the barry chugged slowly forward. The deck vibrating slightly every time something big impacted the hull. Our ship was a true badass maiden of the sea. We all knew that a bunch of dead sea life wouldn't threaten our hull, but still, warships weren't designed to drive through floating graveyards. Even this high up we could literally feel the ship exerting herself in an effort to push through the mass of dead things. Our seabird was hanging back, hovering about a hundred feet over the water, the wall of murk towering over the chopper. The quiet was broken by someone retching somewhere near the starboard bow. Out of the corner of my eye I saw Riggs grin and shake his head slightly. But, my God. Once we were in the thick of it, the stench made even the lieutenant's smile falter. I couldn't describe it to you in words. It's, it's just something you'd have to experience for yourself. 
A scent that offends the soul. An odour that scratches at the lizard brain. Something that knocks ominously on the door leading all the way back to our primordial beginnings. Oh, it's got to be that fog, I remember saying. Shit was abnormal. I swore that it seemed backlit by ever so slight greenish tint. Like there was some bright light way off within the swirling mass. Both ships slowed even further down as they neared the fog bank. Finally, after about another quarter mile, we cleared the corpse field and came to a stop about a hundred yards out. The sea all around us was still dotted with the dead. But, thankfully, the strength of the stench was dialed back as we moved to less crowded waters. Someone must have given the order for the chopper to proceed, because a moment later it pressed forward, climbing higher as it disappeared into the murk. The mist was so thick that it even muffled the sound of the chopper, and within a moment the only evidence we had of bird in the air at all was a faint whoop, 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 thudding in the distance. Oh, I bet that shit's toxic or something. I continued while simultaneously visualizing how long it would take me to get my gas mask out and onto my face. It's got to be some corporate screw-up. Someone dropped a bunch of poisonous shit by accident in the water. Now it's capping the local ecosystem. I began to monologue. I don't know why, but when I get nervous, and that's how I cope. I talk. A lot. Me sideways, Spoon muttered. Well, the hell's growing off of that one. I turned to look. At first, I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. I'm still not sure. It looked to be another filleted humpback, but this one had some weird shit jutting out of it. It was hard to tell at this distance, but something was definitely growing out of the carcass. Well, I don't know what to say here. God, it almost looked like a small tree. There was this thick, twisted trunk. The wood, oh, at least I think it was wood, was shit brown and mottled with patches of fuzzy white mould. I remember in that moment imagining Exhibit saying, Yo, dog, we heard you like horrifying mould, so we put horrifying mould on your horrifying mould. A few sickly-looking branches bent up towards the sky. Upon them sprouted disturbing-looking mushrooms, unnaturally large, the colour of rotten strawberries and dotted with milky white circles. Then the sound of a distant caw drew everyone's attention to the mist. Gulls, Riggs asked, clearly mystified. How the hell are there gulls all the way out there? Soon more caws echoed out of the fog. It became clear that there was a bunch of them somewhere out in the gloom, and by the sound of it, they were heading toward our position. I shrugged. The lieutenant was right. We were more than 400 miles away from any documented landmass. Not even one of those cartoony 12-foot islands with a lone palm tree lay anywhere out here to break the surface of this void. A lone seagull broke through the mist, heading toward us. Shortly thereafter, gulls began pouring out of the swirling miasma in the dozens. Ever so slightly, me and Spoonie raised the barrels of our weapons toward the sky. I pictured Staff Sergeant Alden in that moment, coming out on deck and berating us. What the hell are you bubblegummers pointing your weapons at the sky for? Don't tell me you kids are afraid of some mangy birds, I imagined him saying. But Staff Sergeant Alden did not come out on deck. Instead, we watched as the sky between us and the fog began filling up with gulls. How many of them are there? Spoonie asked in exasperation. I couldn't be sure, but I felt like there were at least a hundred of the little buggers up there, making a racket as they approached. Oof. Must be all the dead sea life, muttered Cole. Yeah, it's a smorgasbord out here. No way, bruv. You think those gulls are dumb enough to eat that rotten shit? Spoonie said. Then, 
as if on cue, the lead seagull dropped a load. I watched the little blob of feces twirl gracefully through the air, falling a hundred or so feet before striking the deck directly in front of Spoony. Why, that little bu- Spoony started to say, but was interrupted by a little blob of poop striking his shoulder. Oh, f- he shouted. I laughed. Couldn't help myself. It's not funny, you wagger, Spoony shouted as he ripped off his jacket. This only made everyone else start laughing. However, the revelry was abruptly cut short as dozens of ship lobs began falling out of the sky like a light summer sprinkle. Oh, shit, Rick said appropriately. Suddenly, Guano's ship began striking the deck all around us. I looked up. <sighs> that was a mistake. Before taking a poop round to the face, I spotted at least 50 birds passing overhead, with what had to be at least a hundred more behind them. And I was pretty sure they were all relieving themselves as one, as the light sprinkle rapidly turned into a steady rain. It doubled over, retching. Then, almost as one, they let loose with the bird equivalent of an artillery barrage. Given my current position on the deck, I felt more than saw the event. Oh, what the f***? Someone shouted. By the time the bulk of the seagulls were passing overhead, the light salvo had turned into a literal shitstorm. Obviously, we weren't supposed to leave our posts, but a few people did anyway, frantically running for whatever cover they could find. Sailors were slipping and sliding all over the deck, a few of them busting their asses pretty hard. I took off my jacket and tried to use it as a makeshift umbrella. I like to think I remained at my post because I'm a good soldier. But the truth is that I didn't run for cover because Riggs was standing right next to me. This reminds me of the last time I saw my ex-wife, Riggs shouted over the cacophony, grinning up from under his own jacket, which he decided to use much like mine. Just then, the can lit up with chatter. All hands, all hands, prepare for emergency landing. The hell, Riggs said to no one in particular. A heartbeat later, the Seahawk came streaking out of the fog. Somehow in the pandemonium, we hadn't heard the sound of her approach. She was listing at a bad angle as she barreled towards us. Squinting and shielding my eyes to see through the shitstorm, it took me a minute to realize what was going on. Chopper was plastered with blood, poop, and feathers. Even at this distance, you could tell that the entirety of the windshield was covered in bird gore. Damn it, Rick shouted. Back, everyone into the deckhouse, on the double. It was clear that not everyone had heard him, but those who did broke and ran. I remained partially spellbound, only managing slow backward steps as I watched the chopper struggle. Riggs ran forward, frantically waving and shouting at those who hadn't moved. The chopper was coming in hot. Already she crossed half the distance between us. Now I could see the black smoke coming out of her rotor. The blaring sound of the impact alarm going off startled me out of my stupor. She was going to hit. There was no doubt. And from the looks of it, she was going to crash pretty much where we were standing. And so I turned and began sprinting away. Now, I may have already mentioned that I'm a recent ex-junkie. So, as you can imagine, I'm not really the American ninja warrior type. I've spent most of my young adult life getting wasted and zoning out on beat-up couches and love seats. Uh, so, I sprint out five ungainly steps before I slip. Scooby-Doo banana peel style on a big old patch of bird turds. It's full on vine material. <laughs> well, I do a sort of half flip in the air. My feet and the darkening sky the last thing I see before the back of my head connects with the deck. I'm not sure how long I was out. Neither is anyone else. Mainly because everyone was preoccupied with $42.9 million of military hardware slamming into $1.8 billion of military hardware. As it were, the more expensive war machine won out in the end. 
Later, I was told the seabird hit the ground sideways. Then began a kind of alligator death roll across the lower deck. At some point, the blades all snapped off, sending deadly sharp pieces of composite titanium and steel shooting across the deck at blinding speed. The six-foot piece actually managed to lodge itself into the frickin' SLQ antenna. But miraculously, there was only one casualty. One of the pilots. The other guy, the co-pilot specialist Billy Hamilton, actually survived. Apparently leaping out of the chopper seconds before impact, then the dude fell about 90 feet. Spoon later told me he'd watched it all happen. This is actually word for word what he said. I recorded his account, and now copy it here. Now, I know this messes with the pacing of the story a bit, but trust me, I mention it because this event becomes extremely relevant later on. 2019-0929 Testimony of Specialist John Witherspoon I was spellbound, mate. It was like the chopper was coming in hot, right? But when Hamilton jumped out of that bird, I just couldn't look away. Seeing him twirling down through the air like that. Thought he was about to pop his glocks for sure. But then, well, the damnedest thing happened. Right below him was one of those dead humpbacks. And growing out of it was one of those fucked up tree things, you know? Well, anyway, this one had some real big mushrooms spraying up from its belly. I don't know, like Super Mario Brothers big. So he, he smashes through this freaking fungus canopy. I can see they're bending really far before breaking, clearly cushioning his fall a bit. Then he hits the dead whale. Oh, and it's so soft, it sort of caves into itself as he slams into it. Oh, he literally disappears into the blubber of this thing. He must have blasted straight through to the other side and out into the water, because half a minute later, I see him bob to the surface. Oh, I couldn't fucking believe it. Luckiest thing I've ever seen. End testimony. Oh, that's verbatim. And Spoon was the only one so far who said he saw what happened. He said it took the chopper smashing into the front of the deck house to snap him back to reality. When I woke up, Cole and Riggs were kneeling over me. Apparently the seabird had rolled right past me. So it's probably a good thing I'm a clumsy oaf. I have a feeling that if I kept running, my slow ass would never have made it through the front door. Thing was, the real proverbial shit hadn't hit the fan yet, but it was about to. In fact, it was about to knock the fan off the damn table. A fire control team was already on deck, dousing the wreckage in flame retardant, black smoke billowing out in a great plume from the destroyed seabird, mixing with the encroaching wall of fog. The previously blue sky was beginning to darken as the overcast rolled south. Medical staff were checking on the injured, and they just finished fishing Billy Hamilton out of the water I'd just been helped to my feet and was taken in the surrounding carnage when the impact alarm blared once again. Oh, fuck. Cole said it like a question. As if in answer, the can lit up again. All hands to stations. All hands to stations. Unidentified craft approaching on a collision vector. That's all I needed to hear. I didn't know what was going on, but the next weird thing that came at me from out of this fog was getting shot. Everyone scrambled to their posts. I jumped on Betsy, flicking off her safety. Deep below, the Barry's engines roared into life, the deck vibrating as she sought to accelerate faster than she probably should have. She turned hard to port. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Riggs unholster his pistol. I almost laughed at that. The Barry let out one long horn blast, even though it was far above our position, the sound was still teeth-rattling. The horn paused briefly, then followed up with five short blasts. Clearly no one on the command deck had yet decided that this unidentified ship had violent intent. Otherwise we would already have been Bird 3, lighting up that fog like the 4th of July. Then, we saw it. A giant black shape hurtling through the mist, moving faster than any ship should through fog that dense. 
its dark outline backlit by that sickly green light. Even as obscured as it was, I could tell there was something off about its shape. The Barry's horn blasted five more times, and the sound was echoed by the PTSD, which was floating about a quarter mile from our starboard beam. The engines roared away far below, but I could already feel it. We weren't going to make it out of the way on time. Holy shit, she's going fast, I said. Why the hell is she going that fast? Rick seemed to ponder the question for a minute before answering. Maybe they were lost in the fog, he said. And when our seabird went in, they decided to follow the sound out. Could be the captain's panicking and going full speed ahead because he doesn't hear the bird anymore. Hmm, was all I managed to say in return. And then the behemoth came barreling out of the gloom about a hundred yards to port, rocketing out of the murk straight at us. I think in that moment, everyone realized it was aiming for us. Shouting sprang up all around the deck. My God. Rig said. Is that the nonny? Spoon shouted. That's the freaking nonny, isn't it? It was. There was no mistaking a super tanker. It was bigger than any ship in the Navy. Until that moment, the largest vessel I'd ever seen was the USS Kitty Hawk. But this was taller and wider by a large margin. But as the details began to resolve, the thing became almost painful to look at. The hull of the ship was a dirty amalgam of corpse blue and rust brown. The steel hull was horribly corroded. Even at this distance we could see the ragged holes where the metal had rotted completely away. It made me think of the kind of cavity that marks the death of a tooth. But it was what was hanging from the hull that was truly disturbing. Bodies. Dozens, no, hundreds... Hundreds of bodies were strewn haphazardly all across the visible underside of the ship, grey and bloated from exposure. It somehow reminded me of tinsel garlands strung across a Christmas tree. There was no rhyme or reason to the corpse's arrangement. Some looked like they were nailed to the rotten steel, Passion of the Christ style. Others were anchored to the hull by rusty chains. Some dangled by the neck like they'd been hung, others by a foot or an arm. The cap had clearly decided that this ship was piloted with malicious intent, because a split second later, the Bushmaster on starboard opened up, letting loose a three-shot burst. The rounds punched a line of hubcap-sized holes through the rotten steel of the vessel. Then someone, I think it was Cole, opened up with their M2, since the command to fire had not been given, this would probably result in some real disciplinary action later on. However, no one seemed to be thinking about that, as the whole deck erupted in a cacophony of gunfire. It was a token gesture at best. What the hell were our brownies going to do to this monster? If anything was going to put her down, it would be the Bushmasters. But even if we turned her into Swiss cheese, at this range I doubted it would make a difference. With dozens of shots pummeling into the super tanker, it was impossible to see where my shots were hitting. Several of the bodies transformed into something that looked like pulled pork. What was more interesting, however, was the effect our shots had on the hull itself. Ordinarily, the rounds would just likely ricochet off the thick hull, but in some places, the decaying steel gave way like paper. Even at this distance, I could see a line of basketball-sized holes stitch their way across the mouldering underside of the ship. Any of our shots should have seen the nanny begin taking on water. But something in the back of my mind told me that this monstrosity didn't give a shit about sinking. The PTSD, for its part took a couple of pot shots on our behalf from its port side A-190s, but they weren't about to launch any heavy ordnance given the target's proximity to our ship. The giant towered over us, casting our ship in its growing shadow. The barrier completed a 90-degree turn, 
and was now trying to accelerate out of the super tanker's way. The gargantuan ship began filling up our entire view on the starboard side. At 50 meters, I spotted something on the enemy's stern that made me stop and stare, despite the cacophony going on all around. There were what looked like gigantic masts. Oh, that's the best way I can describe it. Masts at least a hundred feet tall, as if the ship was commanded by 18th century pirates obsessed with manual lines of sight and wind power. Even from my limited vantage point, I could see yards for the lower, top, and gallant sails. Except, in place of sails, were dozens more corpses, hanging from the yards by chains, swinging lazily in the air high above as the nanny borne down upon us. Seagulls flew about in droves in the sky above the bodies, apparently enjoying the easy pickings. Very quickly, the terrible sight was hidden as the gigantic ship closed the remaining distance. At about fifty feet, all we could see was the massive hull looming over us. To give you an idea of the size disparity here, the USS Barry is about 155 meters long and rises about 20 meters above the waterline. Yeah, she's a big mama jammer to be sure. But the nanny... Well, the nanny was about 500 meters long and rises about 60 meters from the waterline. And that's not even counting the massive fuck all nightmare masts. If the Barry was a great white, then the nanny was a megalodon. Not just a regular one. It was the shark from that movie, the Meg. And, unfortunately, Jason Statham wasn't around to boop it on the nose. The impact alarm wailed once again, and the can lit up. All hands, brace for impact. And so, we did. Almost as one, we stopped firing and just sort of white-knuckled our weapons as the Leviathan bore down upon us. The Barry's engines roared below deck. Giving one final heave, she managed to clear the nanny to a little past the starboard beam. It wasn't enough. We couldn't see where the nanny hit us, as our view past the gatehouse was nil. But we sure knew when it happened. The impact was apocalyptic. The sound of steel colliding with steel was deafening. The world went sideways as I was thrown off my feet. My fingers were ripped painfully from my weapon. I didn't black out or anything, but the impact was so jarring that I literally had an overpowering sense of vertigo, and for a long moment I forgot where I was. I'm not sure how long I lay with my back against the deck, staring up at the spinning sky. Someone grabbed me and hauled me up. It took me another minute to focus on who it was. It was Spoonie. I remember smiling lazily. I remember smiling lazily. Oh, good old Spoonie. Great guy. It took me a couple of seconds to realize he was holding the collar of my uniform in bald fists. Wide-eyed and frantic, he was yelling something. But my ears were ringing, and I couldn't hear him. Oh, let's fucking go! His voice finally cut through my daze and the blaring alarms. Go! I asked. Instead of replying, he began to pull me toward the starboard side. I looked around as I stumbled along. All about us were panicked sailors running to and fro. The hell, I said to no one in particular. The ship's sinking, you wanker. Come on. And then it all came back to me. Well, at least partially. We were about ten yards from starboard now. The nanny. It hit us. Oh, Jesus, McMuffin. He shouted over his shoulder as he dragged me along. That hit turned you into a bloody muppet. The ship listed badly to port, and I almost fell backwards. But Spoonie grabbed me by the collar again and righted me. Come on, mate. The ship's going down. We've got to leg it. I guess that was enough to snap me out of my stupor and I began to sprint along with Spoon. 
The thought was jarring. The entire ship was going under. This place had been my home for nearly two years. I'd lived through the latter part of my opiate withdrawal here. I'd seen the sunrise and set hundreds of times from the decks of the Barry. It was so massive, it felt like a small town. And now, it was headed to the bottom of the ocean. The thought just seemed insane to me. We reached the starboard side. Without pausing, we leapt together. Holding hands, actually. Like this was some shitty Michael Bay film. Like I was Megan Fox and Spoon with Shia LaBeouf. Saving his super-banging motorcycle expert girlfriend from certain doom. Well, I don't know if you've ever fallen 50 feet. But suffice to say, it can really suck. We hit the water hard. The world became a haze of bluish green as salt water shot up my nose. Spoon and I were separated upon impact. I just floated there for a moment, taking it all in. Despite the pandemonium, I felt a sort of tranquility as I hung suspended. The cacophony of muted shouts and splashes echoed in the sea all around. An explosion echoed somewhere overhead. The water around me shook with the force of it. The water was so clear that I could literally see sailors plummeting into the salty water ten yards away. Then I chanced to look down, and my momentary peace was shattered. The blue-green of the water slowly darkened, until, about fifty feet below me, was nothing but a yawning abyss. Well, I've never been a fan of deep water, and in that moment I remembered that I was more than four hundred miles away from anything, in water filled with rotting corpses. I stared down. Spellbound by a void no human was ever intended to look upon. And then, way down in the briny depths, I swear I saw something shift. Some monolithic form quivered and then went still. That's when I decided it was time to get out of the water. A few seconds later, I breached the surface, gasping in a lung full of air. All around me, people were splashing and shouting in panicked tones. McMuffin! Spoon shouted, somehow spotting me amidst the insanity. He swam up to me. There's something below us. I could tell he didn't like the sound of that. Come on, let's get to the lifeboats. And so, we did. Now, um going to give you the abbreviated version of what went down next. Long story short, we got to a lifeboat. Our comrades and the Russians hauling us out of the salty water. Nothing accosted us on our swim to safety. However, there is another kind of surprise to this story. The Barry didn't sink. Nope, she listed like a mother. Really looked like she was going down, but... In the end, the captain kept her afloat. So an absolute assload of us jumped off our ship and into the water for no good reason. I know, right? Ridiculous. Anyway, after the nanny hid us, she seemed to run out of steam. It took us over an hour to get everyone out of the water. And in all that time, the nanny just floated there, as if she were dead in the water. The bloated body swaying and leering at us as we worked to get everyone back in the boat. After that, both the Barry and the PTSD ferried away from the nanny, taking us out of the aqua graveyard and putting about a mile between us and the super tanker. Even though she didn't sink, our ship did take some serious damage. Now, it's after midnight. And even as I lay here in my bunk, crews are working on much needed repairs. Between medical evals and cleaning up what we could, we haven't got much info from the higher ups. But I'll tell you what I do know so far. Captain Diomedes radioed for some backup, but I'm told it'll be days before anyone gets here. The nanny hasn't moved, 
or answered any hails from either us or the Ruskies since the collision. And tomorrow, when the sun rises over this endless expanse, we're going to send a boarding party to the ship. I'm going to be on that boarding party. And, if I'm being honest, I'm not sure how I feel about that. It's great that my captain thinks highly enough to have handpicked me for his team, but our destination is a mystery draped in corpses. So yeah, I'll post again if I live to see my laptop. All I can say for sure is that today I really miss heroin. And private law. So that one was a bit weird, wasn't it? Weird and wonderful, I'd like to say. Um, seems like it's set up for a part two, doesn't it? Would you like to hear more from that? If so, please leave comments in the comment section below the video, and hopefully the author will respond in kind if you want it. Well, that is enough for me for one night. Uh, those of you who've been following me on Twitter will know that I fell off my bike today and injured myself quite badly. Doing okay, though, um, in recovery, but... Well, yeah, going too fast round a corner. My own fault. What can I do, eh? <laughs> Be a bit more careful in future. But it hasn't affected my uh, recording voice or my editing harm. So I will be back again on Wednesday and I hope you're going to join me. You will, won't you? Of course you will. But until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>